Welcome to day two of Renaissance Notes in World History class in Brandon, South Dakota. All right, so today we are going to specifically be looking at Leonardo da Vinci, right? Oh, I just lost my page. There it is. Okay, and Leonardo da Vinci, um, by the way, our third Ninja Turtle, right? Um, he is known as the greatest Renaissance man of all time. That's a pretty big title to have. So the question is why? Well, typically when someone is called a Renaissance man, it's because they're good at lots of different things. In fact, I don't know, a few years ago, there was a movie called Renaissance Man that came out with Danny DeVito, and he was a teacher on an army base. And the reason he was called that was because he was so talented in so many ways, and he was a really, really good teacher. So you'll have to check it out. It's a really good movie. Well, Leonardo da Vinci studied so many different things. He had tons of notebooks that he actually wrote in a special way. I think it was like backwards or something. Do you guys remember? It was in code of some sort. So that that way his ideas were patented and nobody could steal his ideas. And he drew all kinds of things. So you're going to jot down some of these ideas here that you would find in his notebooks. You would find weapon design. In fact, there's one. It's like a tank, and it's in the shape of almost like a flying saucer, and the gun turret goes all the way around 360 degrees. It's really cool. So we had weapon designs. We had human anatomy. Of course, he was one of those guys that brought dead bodies home and studied those dead bodies. Flying machines. In fact, he is credited with designing the first helicopter, basically. He just didn't have the technology to build it. Birds, he studied birds. Astronomy, he studied the stars. And as if that wasn't enough, he was also a sculptor and a painter. How many of you have seen the movie Ever After? It's like the true story of Cinderella. Came out a few years ago, but it's on TV every once in a while, starring Drew Barrymore. What's neat about this movie is Da Vinci is in this movie. He's kind of living in the castle with the king and queen, and you'll see a lot of his inventions in this movie, actually. Uh, like, for example, he created these paddle-like shoes so he could walk on water. Craziest things, his flying machines are in there, all kinds of stuff. So you might want to check this out for extra credit. It's kind of neat. It's kind of a cute movie, too. All right. So Da Vinci was good at lots and lots of different things. Now, another thing I want to tell you about this slide is this is supposedly a self-portrait. So this is what Da Vinci really looked like. But I want to remind you of something. At this point in history, we have not yet invented glass or mirrors. So how in the world do you think he did a self-portrait? Yeah. I think it was water. Yeah, otherwise, how would he know how he looks? Isn't that bizarre to think about? It had to have been a challenge for sure. No mirrors yet. Yeah, that's coming up later in one of our other chapters, actually. So, yeah. All right. So, of course, we got to talk about the Last Supper if we talk about Leonardo. How many of you, raise your hand if you've seen this painting before. Oh, my gosh. For you at home, every single person almost raised their hand, just so you know. Okay, how many of you have this painting in your house or grandma has it in their house? Relative, oh yeah, lots of hands up. Or you have it in your church. Have you seen it in your church? Yeah, it's a really famous painting. In fact, my grandma Pete, God bless her soul, grandma, uh, she had this painting in her house. And I remember as a kid thinking it was the ugliest painting on earth. Because it was kind of drab in colors, and I'm like, oh, for Pete's sake. It was just kind of ugly, I thought. But what's really cool, I didn't realize the story behind it. So I am getting you ready right now, people, to show off at home. You get to go home and impress your parents. Are you ready? Watch this. So cool. Now, first of all, let's review our techniques of the Renaissance before we go on. What techniques do you see in here? List them off. Depth. Depth. What else? Shading. What else? Movement, what else? Symmetry, good, what else? Focus, and how are they focusing? Centering, Centering. what other ones? 
angles. They're all turning towards him or pointing towards him. Good, looking at him. What else? Individual faces. Good. What else? Movement. Movement. Excellent. I think we said that, but that's okay. And there's one other. Light versus dark. In fact, that's why if you look in the back of his head here, that's why they did a window. Because otherwise his face wouldn't shine as much or show up. So that's why they did that on purpose. Okay. So now that we got that all the way, let's talk about what's happening in this painting. So we have to understand the story. So who is our main character here? This is Jesus here. And who are the other, other people here? His disciples. His 12, oops, sorry. 12 disciples. And I know some of you go to church, some of you don't. That's cool. So if you remember, these are like the followers of Jesus. They're his buddies who are telling everybody that he's awesome, basically. Okay? So in this story, Jesus invites all his buddies to a last dinner kind of a thing. And what does he give them? He gives them wine and bread. And he says, the wine represents my blood and the bread represents my body. What do we do in churches today that represents this event in history? Communion. This is why people have communion in churches. Okay? In fact, you know, some of you in this room, I'm guessing, the churches you go to, some of them believe that once the bread and the wine are blessed, it actually converts into the real body and blood of Jesus. They believe something mystical happens. For real. So that's why, you know, some churches go to grape juice instead of wine. That's why certain churches are like, no way, because they really believe it turns into the blood of Jesus. Just a little note for you. Uh, typically the Catholic religion. Yeah, if you are a really like old school Catholic. Yeah. Okay, so now that we know that, he served them bread and he served them wine. And then he tells them two really important things. The first thing he says, guys, I want you to know I'm going to die in a few days. Now, I want you to imagine that you are sitting at the table at lunch today with all your best buddies around the table. Okay? Imagine all your buddies around the table. Then imagine your friends say, by the way, you guys, I just want you to know I'm going to die in a couple of days. Think about how you would react to that. Some of you would be freaking out. Some of you would be worried. Some of you would say, oh, come on, whatever. You know what I mean? You wouldn't believe it. But then he says this. By the way, I'm going to die in a couple days, and one of you is going to get me killed. Freeze. This is what you see in this painting. This is their reaction to him saying, one of you is going to get me killed. And you'll notice that they are all very different in how they react, different facial expressions, lots of body gestures, right? So you are going to be assigned to a group. And your job is to figure out what you think they're saying or how are they reacting to the news that one of us is going to get him killed. Okay? Got the idea? So if you'll look, uh, we're going to pair you into groups, four groups. Here's one, two, three, and four. Now, I will tell you, group three, you probably have the toughest job. This guy right here is going like this. And notice I'm holding up my pointer finger, okay? That's the finger he's using. There are a lot of discussions about what this means. Kind of a weird reaction. So as a group, you're going to have to figure out what you think that means, okay? All right. So remember your number. You're a one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Did you figure it out? Think so? Okay. Um, ones are going to go here, twos here, threes there, and fours in the back. That way you can go look at the computer and see up close, okay? Okay, so let's hear what you guys have to say. Group one, who's our speaker? Come on up. You can stand over there. That way you can point to anything you need to. I'll stand over here. All right. So what do you think they're saying? How are they reacting to one of us is going to get you killed? Oh, interesting. Okay. This person may be guilty. All right. Definitely looking this way. 
Anything else that's going on there? Okay, kind of waving at who they think might have done it. Uh, and these heads are really close together here, you'll see, right? What do you suppose they're doing? Whispering. Proximity usually means either they're kissing or they're whispering, right? In this case, probably whispering. Good. How about uh, this guy here? You'll see his hands are up like this. What do you think that means? What's that? Not me, man. I didn't do it, right? Maybe trying to show that he's innocent. Good. All right. Thank you. Nice job. Give him a hand. Woo. Group two, come on up. Oops, I'll stay on this side. All right, tell us what they're doing. How are they reacting? This one is a little hard to tell, but uh, he kind of thinks that the girl right there, she's kind of smiling, probably thinking that he's just overreacting, giving it, like, you know, drama queen, so to speak. Ooh, interesting. And okay. He's whispering in her ear, probably thinking maybe the same thing. Okay. That guy, I don't know what he's thinking, but... What do you notice about his body? He's, he's turned. Jesus. Yeah. And he's kind of leaning back, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. If, if you so, told me something and I did this, oh, what do you think that means? Shocked. Kind of shocked? Like, what? Are you kidding me? Yeah. I, I think he's a little bit shocked maybe, too. Nice job, bud. Very good. Give him a hand. Group three, come on up. I'll switch sides with you. Actually, we'll talk about it. There's actually controversy about who that really is, so we will discuss that in a moment. Okay, toughest group. Group three, what do you think's going on here? The one with the finger up? That he thinks he's the one that's going to? So what do you think he's saying when he has this one finger up. Okay, so so you think it's this maybe? Other theories about what this might mean? Ah, maybe he's pointing to God or heaven. That's another theory. Any others? Yeah. Pointing. Like how dare you accuse us of such a thing? Good. Other people have thought maybe he's just reiterating what he said. You mean one of us is going to betray you? Maybe like a number one? Other thoughts? I'm thinking while he's saying that, I see uh, the um, guy looking at the uh, man with the white beard who has his hands up. Yeah. Maybe he was in the middle of the speaking though when he's like, but if there's going to be one of us, it would have to be him. Oh, I like that. That's a great answer. Cool. Okay, so what else is going on here? Like the green guy, what's going on there? Good, maybe he's being accused, like you said, from the other side. That could be. Good. And how about the guy in orange? Yeah, and he's probably doing what? Sure. Talking about who would be... And again, I think because of how close he is, he's probably talking to the guy in green, whispering maybe. Yeah. Do you think it's this guy or this guy? Yeah. Good. Nice job, group three. Give him a hand. Group four, you are up. All right. Tell us what's going on in this group. Okay. Well, we think that these two are asking, we believe this is Peter. Of the church as we know. Oh, this one here yep. for those of you at home. Okay. It, this one is Peter. And then these two are asking Peter since Peter is very obedient to Jesus. He's asking them if that is true and if he believes it. And Peter's saying that, well, Jesus won't lie to you, so of course we have to tell the truth. Ooh, interesting. I like it. So they are definitely asking him questions. Yeah. Good. Okay. Now, if you look at the guy in blue here. His hands like that. What do you think that means? He's gesturing towards Jesus to make sure that he's not going to be talking about the same person. Okay. Yeah. I can't believe Jesus would say this. Do you think it's this? Is it true? Good. Other people have thought that maybe he's pointing to a certain, like, 
Do you think it was so-and-so that did it, you know? Okay, good, excellent, give him a hand. Nice job. I could tell this class was smart, awesome answers. Well, this is the interesting part of this painting. Not only is it this reaction, which is interesting, but believe it or not, the guy that's going to betray Jesus already knows he's going to do it. Yeah, in the story, this is what happens. They, uh, The soldiers have been trying to find Jesus. But by this point, they're kind of protecting him because they know that he, they want to arrest him. Um, so they told this guy named Judas that when he's out and the soldiers are around, he said, we want you to kiss Jesus on the cheek so we know that he's the one and then we can arrest him and take him away. And they paid him a whole bag of coin, basically, to do this. At this point in history, he has already taken the money which really makes it interesting, why did he do it, even though he knew Jesus knew? He still went through with it, didn't he? And it ends up getting his friend killed, which leads us to a whole other story, which we will cover when we get to another painting, believe it or not. There's a painting of the next story coming up later. So, yeah, any guesses which one you think is Judas? Now, if you do know for sure, please don't spoil it for the others. Can you tell by how they're being painted? Let me uncover some of this so you can see what's going on in the background. Anybody that looks like a Judas to you? Yeah. This one leaning back here? Okay, because... Excellent, I like it. Other ideas? Yeah. This guy here, because he took off afterwards. Interesting. Other theories. Yeah. This one here? Because? Just a feeling? Oh, okay. All right. Others? Right here? Uh, oh, this one over here. Okay, good. Any others? Good ideas. Do you want to know who it is? All right, let me show you who it is. Believe it or not, it is this guy right here. This is Judas. Now, it's interesting to think about how Leonardo portrayed him. It's not like he had flashing neon signs saying, Here's that awful, evil traitor. He could have painted him all like in evil black or something. But you'll notice he portrays him very much like the rest. But he definitely is shocked that Jesus actually knows what's happening, right? And you can see that in his body language, right? Yeah, so that's Jesus. Now, um, there's also another controversy. And that is this one right here. Adam, you just asked about this. We do not know exactly who that person is. There are two theories. Some people believe that it is John, one of the disciples, and some people believe that it is Mary that was very close to Jesus. Could be either, to be honest, because obviously guys had long hair back then too, you know, Jesus did. So we don't know for sure, and obviously Leo's not around to ask anymore, so all we can do is postulate. Now take a look. This is the real painting. You notice it's not near as bright as the one we were just using, is it? Because it is a fresco. Yes, it is a fresco. It's a wall painting. And not only is it a wall painting, but it is a dry plaster painting. So most of the time when they did frescoes, they would take and make a, an area of the painting wet, and then they'd paint over that wet plaster so that the water and the paint would merge and soak it in. Well, in this case, they use dry plaster so it is really difficult to keep this thing going. It is crumbling. They redo it quite often, but I'm honestly not sure if it's going to last for the ages, you know, which is why you'll see a lot of paintings of it. They want to make sure that it continues throughout history. Um, and um, we actually almost destroyed it ourselves as Americans. During World War II, we were bombing Italy. It, takes, it is um, actually located in Milan, Italy. Luckily, they sandbagged it and protected it. And we didn't end up destroying it, thank goodness. But yeah, so there is the Last Supper. So now you can go impress your whole family 
Everybody show them how smart you are. How cool is that? And before we leave Leo, we got to talk about the Mona Lisa, of course. How many of you think she's kind of ugly? Yeah. And I never really understood why she was famous, but we're going to find out today. There's actually three reasons why she's famous. Uh, first of all, let me hand out a picture showing you what it looks like. Have any of you seen it? Have you seen it? No? Just in pictures or whatever? Right here? Yeah. It is actually located in Paris, France, in the Louvre, you know, the big art museum there. And it's only about as big as, oh my goodness, maybe one of these poster boards. It's really not very big at all. And you can get from where I'm standing to the wall, and there's a, a big thing that separates us from it, and then there's guards by it protecting it all the time. You can take pictures, but uh, you have to be very careful. I think it's no flash, stuff like that. Uh, but it's pretty famous. So um, first of all, when we talk about the different ways to show focus, what one do you see most obviously used here? Light and dark. Yep. Very obvious. Light versus dark is used here. We have the light, light face, the dark hair, the dark dress. So our eyes are automatically drawn right to that face. We also have centering, right? And we even have angles. But you say, Mrs. Terpstra, there's nobody else in the painting pointing at her or looking at her. So how are their angles? Well, I named it the triangle technique, okay? And this is what it means. If you look at her shoulders, you know how slouched they are? It makes the form of a triangle like this. And our eyes are naturally drawn to the top or the point of a triangle. Think about it. Have you ever looked at a picture of the pyramids? What do you look at? The top, right? We look at the top of a pyramid. So that's what helps lift our eyes up to her face. So that is called the triangle method. Okay, so let's find out why this painting is so famous. Well, first of all, it's because it was stolen. Anytime you have something stolen, it makes the headlines, right? It was stolen in 1911, and it actually disappeared for two years. They didn't get it back until 1913. It was stolen by one of the workers at the museum, and he basically stole it away. Um, but think about it. Someone who steals art, what do they eventually want to do with it? Sell it. So like an idiot, he tries to sell it, and he gets busted, obviously, because he goes public. So they arrest him. They get the painting back. Guess how long he spent in prison for this deal? Seven months. <laughs> Seven months. Can you believe that? And they let him out, and it was the end of it all. Can you believe that? It's crazy. Yeah, so that obviously made her kind of famous. The second reason that she's famous is we don't know who she is. There are three different versions, okay? The first theory, and I need my paper for this one, is that she is the wife of a wealthy nobleman, and he hired Michelangelo to do her portrait. And her name was, here we go, Lisa D. Antonia Maria Dinaldo Gerardini. But we're going to call her Lisa D. for sure. So, and that is a person we know existed, a real person, okay? The second theory is that it's just another noble woman. But we don't know specifically who it is. And the third reason, I'm actually going to erase this. You'll understand why in a minute. Good grief. Okay, the third reason, uh, or the third theory, is that it is actually, how do I say this? That it is similar to his self portrait. Now, I want to be clear with you, I am not saying that Leonardo was a cross-dresser and he's doing himself in drag. That's not what I mean. And by the way, Mr. Nelson, our art teacher, does not believe in this third theory, just so you know. 
we've discussed it. Um, I think this is what happened. Some people believe that it wasn't like he had a model for this painting, that he just painted it out of his head. And as he painted it out of his head, there were similarities between the face on his portrait and the face with this woman. But I would think that that's just logical, right? Those of you that draw, you know that there are certain ways that you paint noses or eyes, for example. We all have techniques that are similar, right? Let me show you an easy example of that. You ever looked at cartoons? Lots of different characters for the peanut cartoons, but notice their faces. What do they have in common? Their noses are all exactly the same. What else? Their eyes are the same. What else? Their smiles, other than if they're talking, are the same. And you'll even notice their ears are all the same. So this is a simplified version, but even an artist that's doing a really detailed portrait still does eyes a certain way on every painting. So would it make sense that the portrait and this one are the same in some ways? At least that's what I figured anyway. So there you go. Now the third reason why she's famous is because um, he used a technique that had never been used for called sfumato. S-F-U-M-A-T-O. Now, those of you who have studied this painting, you probably have noticed this or talked about it already. But if you haven't, I want you to look at this painting. Do you notice she has no eyebrows? And she has no top lip? Yeah. I'll be honest with you, until I actually taught this, I looked at this painting a million times, and I never noticed she had no eyebrows. I just never noticed it. Okay? And let me tell you um, what the definition of sumato is. Are you ready? To write it down, here it goes. The definition of sumato is blurring or blending. Blurring or blending. So the eyes fill in the details. Blurring or blending. So the eyes fill in the details. So you'll notice that he's basically not drawn in eyebrows, but he's blended in some different colors. And because every time I look at your faces, I know we all have eyebrows, our eyes just automatically put it there because we expect it to be there. Same thing with an upper lip. You all have two lips. So even though he didn't draw a lip, we see it there because we automatically expect it to be there. Isn't that weird? Now, there are some historians that have argued that maybe she did have eyebrows and they wore off over time. Well, whether that happened or not, and whether he did it intentionally, it has started something. Because if you look at really good painters, it's not like they actually draw her lips like this. I mean, do you see that on a good painting, though? No, because it blends in with our skin, doesn't it? So he's actually the guy that started that technique. And that is the third reason why this painting is famous. Okay? All right. Our last picture of Leo is actually a drawing. Raise your hand if you've seen this drawing before. Uh, in fact, I guarantee you, this was on the cover of my high school science textbook back in the 80s. But I didn't know what it was. It even has a name. Anybody know what it's called? It is called the Vitruvian Man. Vet, V-E-T-R-U-V-I-A-N, the Vitruvian Man. And remember we said that Leo had these notebooks where he did all these drawings? This is basically a page that was torn out of his notebook. And yes, if you're thinking it, you're right. He is drawing a dead body at the moment that he drew this picture. So let's see, I need a, I need a dead body. Do you have a t-shirt on under there? Yeah. All right, would you take this off and come up, please? You can be my dead body. <laughs> I love it. Okay, come here. So imagine I'm uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and imagine this body here is dead and it's laying on my table. Okay, and he would be naked actually, but we won't make him get naked today. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna show your muscles here, dude. All right. All right. 
So the first thing he did is he laid the legs straight forward. And you'll notice he's practicing drawing the quads, the front of the legs, the muscles here. And then he took the arms and he put them out in a T formation, just like this. And notice what it does to these muscles here. You see that? And then he started to draw. And he drew the musculature of the arm in this position, right? He's practicing. Then the second position he did, he took the legs and put them in an X with the toes pointed out somewhat. And all of a sudden now, you'll see that he is enacting the muscles on the inside of the thigh here. And the quad muscles start to show up. I remember there was a guy in high school, he was so cute. And he had, I swear it was a bar of soap in his calf. You ever seen people strong like that? He was so cute. So cute. Anyway, I digress. And now everybody knows I'm a pervert out there. Anyway, so um, legs are in an X. And then he took those arms and he moved them up like this. Now look at what happens to his muscle when he's here to when he turns like this. Do you see what happens? The muscle changes position. So again, he draws and notices where the muscles are. So that way when he does his paintings and his sculptures, he'll have the muscles in the right place. Because obviously, if he were here, to do a big old bump like this wouldn't make sense, would it? Right? It's not realistic. Give him a hand. He was a great dead body. Nice job, nice job. <laughs> Very good. Our last piece for today is Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel and our fourth Ninja Turtle. Very cool. Now, we're actually going to watch a whole movie about the Sistine Chapel. So once we get this done, that's what we're going to do. All right. So here's the story. The first thing you need to know about Michelangelo Bonarotti is he was a sculptor. In fact, the only painting he ever did is this one right here. Every other piece you will see is a statue. So what happens is the Pope, Pope Julius, comes up to Michelangelo because he lived in that area. And he says, Michelangelo, I want you to paint the ceiling of the chapel that we worship in. It was called the Sistine Chapel for, I believe, Pope Sixtus, one of his relatives. Anyway, he says, I want you to paint the ceiling. And he said, why are you asking me? I'm a sculptor. I'm not a painter. He said, I believe in you, Michelangelo. I know you can do this. I know you're going to do great. So after a lot of hemming and hawing, he finally decides to do it. Now let's get an idea of what he's up against here. Let's take a look at this. This ceiling is interesting. Um, have you been in the wood gym here at school? It's about that uh, across, that same distance across. It's a little bit longer, and it is higher. It's 65 feet in the air. So I, I would say the closest thing to picturing it would be the wood gym, all right? But you'll notice the ceiling is not a flat rectangle, is it? It's curved. And if you know anything about proportion and drawing people, adding a curve to it adds an extra curveball, you might say. Okay? So notice that the top basically goes like this. And then on the edges, it's almost like a birthday cake. They go like this. Very difficult to draw. Hey, Rishi. 